Mathematical Imagination. I'm your host, Jim Vredos, and I'm a sociologist who's taught at John Jay College of Criminal Justice and Yeshiva University here in New York City. This is part two of our discussion with Nelson Dennis. He's written a classic, groundbreaking work entitled The War Against All Puerto Ricans, in which he meticulously documents the largely overlooked history of revolution and terror in Puerto Rico. From the U.S. invasion in 1898 to over 50 years of military occupation and colonial rule. From the unsuccessful armed insurrection in 1950 to the modern day struggle for self-determination, autonomy, and independence. Nelson was born in Manhattan from a father of Cuban and French descent and a mother who was originally from Puerto Rico. He was eight years old when the FBI forcibly removed and deported his father from their Washington Heights apartment because he supported the Cuban Revolution. He never saw him again. Mm. Nelson was the editorial director of El Dario, the largest Spanish language newspaper in New York City. He's a graduate of Harvard University and Yale Law School and served as a New York State Assemblyman from 1997 to 2001 in the 68th Assembly District, which included the East Harlem and Spanish Harlem neighborhoods. He wrote and directed the feature film, Vote For Me, which premiered at the Tribeca Film Festival. In 2018, he completed his second feature film, Make America Great Again. Joining us today is Felipe Luciano, one of our most prominent leaders and visionaries in the awakening of the new consciousness-raising radicalism among Puerto Ricans in New York and across the country. Felipe grew up in a housing project in Spanish Harlem, which he's described as the crap hole of the world. In the mid-1960s, he became a member of The Last Poets, an ensemble of African-American and Afro-Puerto Rican poet performers who early anticipated the rap compositions of a later era. He helped solidify the strong cultural bonds felt by Norokan and the black arts movements. In 1968, he helped found, create, and became chairman of the New York chapter of the Young Lords, where he and the group were instrumental in promoting an agenda of militant direct action and community empowerment, ethnic pride, and civil rights. Felipe is a two-time Emmy award-winning radio, television, and print journalist, and the first Puerto Rican news anchor of a major media network in the United States. He's the longtime host of Latin Roots and What's Happening shows, which can be heard on WBAI public radio station in New York City. So thank you so very, very much, both of you. Thank you. For being here. It's really an honor and a blessing. And um, in our part two discussion here, we want to begin finishing up on the discussion we had last time with you, uh, Nelson, about the history of Puerto Rico and its relationship with the United States. And I think we were up to the mid-1930s, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you want to carry it on from there to... There was a rapid progression of ownership. Uh, the, 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 the precursor to it all was when uh, General Nelson Miles hosted, hoisted Old Glory up the Tau flagpole at Ponce and said that we come here, and this was in 1898 in the uh, U.S. occupation, that right. we come here not to occupy you, but to protect your, your liberty, uh, your properties, and to bestow the, the blessings of enlightened civilization. That, that was the, you know, that was the, the framework. Well, uh, if you fast forward 30 years later, uh, within one generation, after a currency devaluation and CP graduated property taxes and a massive land appropriation, because there was no usury law, so the, any loans were made mm. with you know, ec extreme interest rates, the farmers defaulted. Within 30 years, 80% of the arable land in Puerto Rico was owned by North American banking syndicates. They were generally organized into something called centrales, and the largest four of them, Guanica, Aguirre, Fajardo, East Puerto Rico Sugar, those four alone owned nearly 50% of the, the agricultural acreage of Puerto Rico. Mm. Now, now we're in the depression. People are now working on land 
for sub, not, not substandard, but subhuman wages on land that they previously owned. So all of a sudden, you, it, it becomes a matter of sheer survival, being able to feed your children. Uh, an agricultural strike bro broke out, and it was found that, true to form, the local uh, representatives in San Juan were selling out the rank-and-file membership for their own little contracts, their own little advantages. And, mm -hmm. uh, and there was generally a racial breakdown. The lighter-skinned tended to be the ones in, pos in positions of management and negotiation. So we're at a point now where these people now are literally starving. They can't feed their children. It's in the middle of the Great Depression. They have, mm -hmm. where do they turn? There was one man who had the, uh, the, the gumption, the vision, the ethics, the sense of purpose. He was the first person to go, to, uh, first Puerto Rican to graduate from Harvard and Harvard Law School. Mm -hmm. And he returned, and he got all sorts of sinecures, uh, all sorts of offers when he graduated as valedictorian of Harvard Law School. Interestingly enough, they didn't allow him to, to, to uh, deliver the valedictorian speech because his skin was too dark and that was mm. considered a blight on the Harvard community. Mm. They literally delivered his diploma. I mean, there was no FedEx, but he got his diploma through the mail. That's how uh, 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 Don Pedro Albizu Campos uh, was f finally acknowledged as a full-fledged lawyer and he returned to his hometown of Ponce and started a one-man law office basically defending poor people, his neighbors. Mm. Um, but it was, it was his way of establishing his roots and, and uh, uh, reframing himself, not as some sort of Ivy League graduate. He was also a, a lieutenant in the U.S. Army during the Second World War. I mean, this guy yeah. was 100 percent of America. He had all the credentials. He could have traveled you know, very aggressively through the, uh, all the ranks of American society. But what he chose to do, as an American, yeah. believing in the fundamental principles of, 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 uh, of the, the, that government requires a re that the, the consent of the governed, he went down, yeah, and he, that with all his studies, indicated to him that basically uh, the 1898, that, that the resolution of the Spanish-American War was really a real estate uh, transaction rather than anything else, and that Puerto Rico was inherently, constitutionally entitled to its ind independence. Well, well, what was his family background? Just a little bit about no, his, uh, To explain it, some of the His, his father was a, was a, a hard-nosed Spaniard. Uh, uh, from Galician, uh, from from uh, uh, un gallego, from fi uh, f from fishing fisherman stock in in, in Spain. Hmm. His father disowned him. Uh, he was he was born out of wedlock to uh, a local dark skinned w woman who uh, she had to undergo all the fissures and the pressures of not being recognized as the you know the the love partner of this man that was a, lo a local landowner. His father ne ne never recognized him as his, as his, as his son. Mm -hmm. um, so he came from a, fr uh, f a fractured uh, e uh, background. His, his aunt took him in, his, the sister of the woman. The, his mother committed suicide. She oh, essentially wow. walked into a river. She just, mm. that's- At uh, what age? Uh, was at about four or five of the-, of the of, of, She uh, was four or five then? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. But his, 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 his mm. uh, aunt, was you know very assiduous, very religious, uh, and very vigilant o o over him. And he had you know he had an, in a, a sense a, 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 a sort of a Huckleberry Finn it, 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 in an odd way. Mm. Um, he was he was ragged. He was barefoot. He didn't start school until he was about ten or eleven years old. Mm. But he accelerated so quickly that by the time by he, the time he was in high school, he had went through all four. He he basically skipped a grade every year. Uh, and mm -hmm. he graduated as valedictorian of his high school class, the head of the debating team, and he got a, a, uh, a scholarship to the University of Vermont, and then a complete scholarship to, to Harvard. Um, this man, he, he was amazing. Uh, he was fluent in six languages. He had a degree in chemical engineering, and he went to Har Harvard Law. Uh, uh, he, he was a, a, a polyglot he w at, at, at an autodidact. He was a self-taught Renaissance man. Um, well, so we're, we're fast yeah. forwarding down the into, the, into the Depression. They, have no, they turn to Albizu Campos, the, the laborers, los macheteros, the sugarcane workers. The FLT, La Federación Liberal de Trabajadores, was, uh, was selling them out in, in, the, in the contract negotiations in San Juan. So they turned to Albizu Campos and he explained, look, I've been you know, advocating, organizing, editorializing on behalf of the independence of Puerto Rico. I'm the president of the Nationalist Party. So you have to understand that you know there is this political you know not baggage but 
uh, the, these nuances, all these levels, will enter. They said, we don't care. We're starving. We can't feed our kids. He then negotiated, he gave this famous speech in Guayama. It was, and there's pictures of it in, in, in my book. It's it just, in a, he was a thunderous orator. Uh, I think that you've taken a page or you've taken a page from each other, Felipe, <laughs> I mean, seriously. Um, so he was able to, you know, uh, to c communicate and enrapture people with, hi with his vision. They, uh, long story short, Pinkerton guards, violence, all sorts of ups, ups and downs, uh, uh, physicality in, in this, in this island-wide strike that shut down the Puerto Rican economy for eight months, but they prevailed and they doubled the wages. And it, it went from roughly six cents to 12 cents an hour, which, which spelled the difference between starving and not. Mm. This was, and you, Wall Street had never recognized him. He, he had been going on and on about the independence of Puerto Rico, but at this moment, when he affected the uh, United States in their pocketbook, he suddenly registered. Uh, he, uh, he was on their radar. And within four months, they had him in jail uh, and on charges for seditious conspiracy against the United States. And if you just look at the, the record, will, sh will show that his one, what was his one crime? To represent in a, in a, in a yeah. legitimate negotiation as, as the union. And a political and, you know, leader. Yeah. 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 Um, he goes to jail for 10 years. They get him on, on trumped up charges. They have, they have to have two hung juries. Um, but they, they, pr they prevailed in court. He goes to Atlanta Penitentiary. By the time he comes back, now I'll start fast forwarding a little bit. He comes back in, in 1947. Within s three to four months, they passed something called La Ley de la Mordaza. Uh, the, a gag law, it was uh, La Ley 53. It was modeled almost word for word on the, on the anti-communist Smith Act that was uh, running rampant in the United States that was a, a precursor to McCarthyism. Yeah. Um, so they used this Law 53, which was very specific in its wording. If, the, if you enunciate, speak, sing, uh, utter a sound, uh, uh, circulate a leaflet, Anything in favor of the independence of Puerto Rico or any word or utterance of any sort against the United States was punishable. It was a felony and punishable by up to 10 years in jail. Mm -hmm. It was a complete abrogation of the First Amendment mm -hmm. in order to shut one man up, Pedro Albizu Campos. Not only that, immediately after this, this strike, they brought in a new, gen a, a new governor who had, had been, his experience was being an army general. And with, with primary experience in, in dealing with Native American populations in the United States, General Blanton Winship, that became the new governor. He entirely militarized the police force of the United States, brought F FBI agents in, engaged in Tommy gun training, and they brought in a new chief, police, uh, chief of police, E. Francis Riggs, whose father was the owner of the Riggs National Bank, the largest bank in Washington, D.C., which was being used to destabilize regimes all over South, uh, Central and South America at, at, at the time. Um, so this was the sort of immediate sea change in the politics of Puerto Rico. Yeah. La Ley 53, a law that, you know, that uh, basically uh, disallowed people from speaking with each other. Yeah. A, a, an army general, a secret police type of, 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 ch of chief of police, and an entire re regime that, 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 the, that was predicated on fear and suppression yeah. and division of the Puerto Rican population. Mm -hmm. This takes take us now into the early 40s, early 50s, and that is the immediate precursor to the Commonwealth uh, arrangement, which was really nothing but a colonial tapestry. It was just a complete, I, I'm sorry to go on, at, you know, no, at some level. Like yeah. The United States was engaged in a public relations battle with Russia to be the so, so yeah. quote unquote leader of the free world. And you could ill afford to, to, to lay that claim yeah. and to establish economic hegemony throughout the world if it is disclosed that you are the owner of the only surviving colony on the planet, which is Puerto Rico. Yeah. Yeah. And so this is where they, they, they decided to have a, uh, an election and have the first elected Puerto Rican governor, which was uh, uh, Luis Muñoz Marin, and he basically created his own party, the Partido Popular Democrático, and, uh, and they engaged in this, this, this framework. They introduced that Puerto Rico was now going to vote on its own, its, uh, its own self-determination, whether to remain allied, United, allied with the United States, remain in its, it's in its current condition, or engage in what was called a, a sort of a, re, a reframing, it's re, what it was in the end, of the political condition of Puerto Rico as Commonwealth. Estado Libre Asociado, free associated state, which is a triple misnomer because it's not a state, mm. it's not free, and how can you associate wh wh when you have no negotiation position from which to establish the, the nature of that association? So it's not a freely, it's, uh, there is no ELA. And that's become readily apparent now 
with the Financial Control Board that has commandeered the entire, the, the entire economy for the payment of a debt that is illegal from, from the, in the first place. And impossible to pay back. And if, if, I, I, if, I wonder if we could just turn to Felipe for a few minutes and get back to what you're talking. As you hear what Nelson's talking about, growing up in that crap hole of the world, can you relate to some of the pain and, and, and I'm tension to, that was I'm, going on I'm, in, in your own upbringing? I'm trying to stop from crying. You have to understand that this man lost his mother. His rage was beyond military. His rage was beyond political. He lost his mother. Yeah. He was denied legitimacy by his father. He had to prove himself. Thank God he had enough heart, courage, and some spiritual strength to go forward. He loved his island. I understand the love of it. I understand my, my by the way, my all my family on my father's side were all nacionalitas. My grandmother was at, at the Massacre de Ponce, I never knew this. Her brother, Carmelo, was his bodyguard at Atlanta, in Atlanta. Mm. But as I hear Nelson so eloquently describe the genius of the man and the brutality and the sheer senselessness of it, um, I fill up with so much rage. It's rage. I have a poem yeah. that, that kind of answers that. Um, Read it. Uh, I'd love to hear it. And and you wrote uh, this when you were part of the... No, no, I, I, these poems, are, some of them are old, some of them are new. Some old, new yeah. I'm tired of hearing of how much we love, of danzas and bombas and bread above the door. What more can be said of this culture we own? It shimmers and quivers from Ponce to Sixth Street and fries the frozen memory of mambos long past. The hands that do push-ups on the stone floors of jail cells remember the spiny roughness of pineapple. The slice of the knife into juice and yellow meat. The gnarled stubby fingers that grip the fleshy throats of wrinkled old ladies cry out for the smoothness of sugarcane and shriek for the feel of the earth. We can't grow coffee on windowsills. Rice can't sprout through concrete. It is madness we fight at four in the morning as we pace the, str as we pace the streets of our hovels. Lunatics we become, reading our poetry and waiting for God. I'm tired of hearing of how much we love, of the reasons why Columbus was never murdered, of brown nipples that welcomed sick white men to suck and the rapes that made weakens the rainbow. Don't speak to me of tolerance to justify the crimes against our babies and the sins of our inaction. It is there for the world to read on the foreheads of your sons, in the stomachs of your daughters, in the black brain room you run to when the cheap rum seeps through, you know the real deal. The rooster that was held in the cage on the lap of my grandfather on the flight from San Juan screamed pitifully all the way to Coconut City, drew blood from the condescending stewardess's hand. Who the hell was she kidding? He knew the direction of the metal bird, felt the coldness on his skin, flung himself wildly against the bamboo bars and shouted obscenities to his master and anyone else within hearing distance. You coward, he called him. You good-for-nothing imbecile. You left the sun to reach for a cold furnished room? And what happens to your space now, Hibaro? Will you smile for me if you live in a box? Will you be able to kiss my beak through your tears? Will I be able to run through the yard and take care of my seed? Or will you have me cockfight for you, cocksucker? And hearing no answer, bashed himself against the bars and died in a feathery mess. I'm tired of hearing of how much we love. Love is offense, not defense. Love is sticking a knife in a landlord's back for killing four kids in a fire. It's grabbing a child by the roots of his hair as he lunges for the straps of a purse. It is anger and rage and caring enough to whip the system, not your wife. Love is making a city stomach quiver when you make your quiet demands. You can't love me and be nice. 70,000 Tainos were nice, makes the word Spaniard taste bitter in my mouth. Albizu Campos was nice, and they gave him nice torture doses of radiation to treat the fire in him that was not so nice. Salvador Allende was nice and got it nicely in the back of his fucking head. I'm tired of hearing of how much we love and how nice Puerto Ricans behave, of how we are natural diplomats who would rather die than offend. The facts contradict our existence. I am not invisible. I am flesh and bone and penis and blood. Aren't you tired of loving yourself to death? That's what I feel about it. Yeah. 
I think it's, I'm just waiting for the time. Maybe I'll die before it happens. But I think that um, it's high time uh, Puerto Ricans begin to develop a, a culture of self-esteem. We've, we've lost that a lot. Colonialism has an insidious way of robbing uh, the marrow of your bones. Uh, it, it permeates the epidermis. It corrodes the soul to the point where you tell your own kids, you, you can never do this. It can never happen. How many times have I heard that in Puerto Rico? You can't do this. You can't do that. And it happens here. And, hap and sometimes we never thought that it would happen here. Because in the 40s and 50s, while my grandmother was coming here, um, during the time that uh, Nelson is talking about, there was no food, there was nothing in the 30s. They came here because they wanted a better future. Yeah. And um, when you look at the pictures of Puerto Ricans, the serrated, you know, the, the, the little Kodak things, you see them proud, thinking that they were going to make it. Um, and slowly, insidiously, they began to die um, in the factories. They began to die in jails. They began to die from, ha by the 60s, it was a wrap. Because you were saying before the show, as we were discussing, you, you said so eloquently, that you yourself felt as a young kid, there was no hope. There was no way out of this. There was, there is now, now it's even worse, there was a nihilistic culture before, but in the 60s, we had each other. We could talk to black people. We, we had revolution. We had great spokespersons. We had Martin. We had Malcolm. We had uh, uh, Albizu. We, we, Pete, who's still alive, right? He died in 65. We had people who were, who were standing up for us. We had Helena Valentin here. We had even Herman Badillo. We have nothing now. Um, the only ones who were able to keep us alive, thank God for them, were the musicians. The Tito Puente, the Tito Rodriguez's, the Machitos. They kept us going. But uh, the Joe Cubas, uh, the Ray Barretos, the Eddie Palmeris, they're the ones. Sanabri, uh, Bobby Sanabria. And Bobby Sanabria. Sure. Um, uh, and don't forget Chico Farrell either. We no. really uh, have been kept alive by sheer will, by sheer dint of, of, of survival. So while, he, while I'm listening to him, uh, the rage in me, and I have to be careful with my rage. I have to be careful with it because that's what started in the Young Lords. That's what I, I, I was serious about hurting people. Well, <laughs> in part one, right, uh, Nelson, you were talking about the rage you were experiencing at that Connecticut uh, prep school you were in, right? And, and you got out of that closet and beat the hell out of this kid that was, and, 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 and can you make perhaps a segue into your own artistic endeavors through your movies uh, to deal with what Felipe is talking about too, with, with humor, with. Uh Let me make note of a few things. I appreciate the reference to Ralph Allison's Invisible Man at, yes. the, at, the, at the conclusion of that, right. that really capsul encapsulate things. Uh, Thank you. You know, because that invisibility is part of, uh, yeah. part of being the bane of our existence because one, we're, we're a very, um, giving, uh, gregarious, uh, very democratic, I it's, in it's on our soul it's from the very beginning when we showed the, n the gold nuggets to, co to Columbus and then they started, you know, they, you had to bring a hawk's bell of gold or have your hands chopped off. That's what they, what they, what they did to the, ta to the Tainos sure, early on. Sure. Um, second, in terms of the sepia tone uh, photographs, there's uh, one thing that if you notice in terms of the, the dignity and the strength of that community and it's something that I think we've lost, this is an observation of mine, and I could be wrong, but it seems to me that when I look at those photographs, and when my mother came, uh, they, the way that they dressed, yes. there was this dignity. They always had a suit on, a, yes. a fedora, uh, every, uh, every working man at a mm. baseball game, at a... At a they uh, were kings and queens. They were caciques. The, the, you, the, the, with the little that they had, yes. yeah. they maintained a sense of community and accountability and, and reciprocity. Uh, and that's how, I, I remember, that's how we got th through. I mean, we had these extended families that would, would, would support each other. Um, and it was actually the communities, too, because if you did something wrong, by the time you got home, you could have gotten your ass beat four or five times by, by you know, and, mm -hmm. and your mother would, uh, would thank them. Mm -hmm. That's the, you know, the yeah. kind of fabric that was, uh, wasn't that the case? Yeah. I mean it, was, it was family. And right here, this is on 4th Street. This was a hub, right along here. Th it was a hub for two reasons. Um, the police station was here. Yeah, on and this block. And the fire engine, right here, right Across next door. Across the street, right? the fire engine. The 23rd fire Precinct, which yeah. I visited a few times. Yeah. Um, and um, <laughs> uh, who was the police chief who was the head of here? He was the one of the guys. Lynch? I can't remember his name. No, Kelly. Uh, Kelly. Raymond Kelly. He was head. 
he was a sergeant right here. Really? Um, to speak of El Barrio, to speak of Spanish Harlem in the 50s is to wax romantic because it was a beautiful place to be. Now, as much as I didn't like, and I, I may have mis misspoken, because I grew up in the Johnson Projects, and it was a wonderful place to be. Um, I didn't know I was poor, I didn't know I was black, and I didn't know, I knew I was Puerto Rican. Um, and I knew that, I knew that I loved the mix of cultures. This was a place that had 100,000 Russian Jews. I was gonna get that. you also were taught mainly what? Jewish I was teachers? I, I had uh, Ashkenazi Jews who taught me. Uh, some of them had very conservative fa fathers. We had, we had a synagogue right on my, across the street from my house. That is, I grew up with Italian culture. Right. Um, Sicilian, basically. I didn't see a light-skinned Italian until I was in high school. Hmm. Most of them were dark. I grew up with um, uh, Ashkenazi Jews. I grew up with uh, Southern blacks. I mean, what better, way to, what better way to come into the world? And to this day, I get along with all those cultures. I love those cultures. I go yeah. to Chinatown, I love it. I, I go into a shul, I love it. And of course, I'm always close to black people. Um, and, I, and I speak a little Yiddish because I was raised by Ashkenazis and they taught me, um, uh, they have their idiomatic expressions, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I learned to love the culture. Uh, I don't love the policies of Israel, let me make that clear. But I love Israel and I love the Jewish people. Right. Um, as, as Nelson is talking about what was happening and the gold we had, it leads me to this poem. This is a poem called Tumaya. Um, and it's about the first ones who came here who we believe were the Vikings. They came, they saw, and they did not exploit, they left. The ones who came again, because after them there was the theory and the mythology that other white men were going to come. That was the, the Mexicans had the same thing. Um, they said more, more people will come because they had this prophetic vision. The hips that hug, the belly that wrapped, the baby that gave me joy, rise up and down methodically at one in the morning as the barrio breeze fresh with asphalt, new sidewalks, cigar smoke and mofongo, filters through the new windows in the new building that with the new people that was once the old nursing home for Jewish folks on 107th Street. Money can make people want to leave the trees of Connecticut for the bushes of El Barrio. Power can make them stay, but the laughter is what makes them happy. I've seen them come in swarms like locusts, ripping, raping, rhetorically stating the need for structure and sanity, sobriety and standards, and still they stay and smile at the dropouts who shyly whistle at them with adolescent eyes. They stay and laugh and cry and feel and fuck and find God in what was once called human refuse because the rainbow can't be hidden by laws, nor passion by labels. We who seek to simply love ourselves our way, we who are loyal to smooth brown skin, spicy red beans, shiny white rice, sweet yellow platanos and black bombas would rather die than not love and live and love and live and love and live our way. We were the first, damn it. We were enjoying the sun, the wars, our women in baseball before this lost Italian and his Spanish hired hands found our bay in 1493. We helped this motherfucker live and he gave us God in a statue. Was he mad? Did he suddenly go insane? We bowed to no one but Yuki Yu, and he's so magnificent, only a fool would try to capture his spirit in stone. We bowed to him in humility, in awe, in repose, thinking of those stories our grandfathers told us about the white gods with yellow beards flying across the waters in white sailed seabirds, the ones who came and taught and listened and learned and left us the fuck alone. We gave them the little gold we had. We smoked the tobacco weed with them inhaling the smoke and fragrance on the edge of a lush green mountainside, overlooking the valley of paradise, the sea of children. And we partied for weeks when without saying one thing to each other, we both knew it was time to leave in love, in peace, in harmony. And we wished them Godspeed and had some of their seed in our young girls' wombs. And they promised one day to come back. They took nothing, they wanted nothing, only to learn to love. How are we to know that they who came again were from a different tribe, a different time, an ugly government, a two-faced religion? Oh, my son, we didn't know. So we bowed mm. because it is our way. Regardless of what others have on their minds, we, the rainbow people, bow in humility and friendship to strangers with bad habits. Mm. Our house is always your house. And they took our words and twisted them, took our heart and pounced on it, took our land and scarred it, took our young men and made them think that their fathers were low-life, lazy, good-for-nothing baby givers with no real God and no real culture and no real stomach for fighting. So 
In the 20th year of 1500, we, the young, the old, the sick, the wounded, the pregnant, the barren, threw ourselves at their forts and fell into thousands. Little metal balls, bullets they call them, pierced our skin, robbed our legs. We couldn't run, so we crawled. We couldn't throw spears, so we bit off their ears. And for 10 years, we fought and died and fought and died until 60,000 of us littered the beaches of Borinquen, the bones sun bleached in the sand, sticking out grotesquely on what used to be such a nice playground. And finally, we stopped because we love to live and love our mothers and fathers and viejitos whose tears filled rivers, whose dreams were shattered and they sat by their boils and simply stopped talking and stared at the footprints of their slain sons in the mud and every once in a while they would suddenly burst out laughing and sing a sad song, pick their noses and look at no one in particular. And as their hair fell out in the rain, they suddenly became like babies and played with their genitals and shat near the fires where we ate and spoke of boogeymen and the threat of darkness. It is when we became afraid of the night. We who owned the stars lost our song and found comfort in fire water and poppy seed and cocoa leaves. So when you see the sons of the sons of the sons of the sons of the grandsons of these ancient men in the drug dens of Babylon, remember the rainbow because it's all we have left. It's all we cherish now. And that is why we laugh in despair. We know where this dream is going. We know where this dream is going. Do you? Oh. Let me, uh, following up on that passion of Felipe, yes. let me, um, and to uh, emphasize the interrelatedness yes. of this community where you grew up and the, f the, f the, the, f the, f the feelings and the, the DNA that runs through it all. Yeah. Um, and I'm following through on the Ley 53 and the oppression in Puerto Rico. Part of that law was that you couldn't own a Puerto Rican flag. Yes, that's and right. You couldn't not, not merely not display it. You couldn't even have it in the privacy of your own home. That would subject you to ten, uh, ten years in prison. It could be a, a little flag the size of, of a postage stamp. So here, here's what happened. That was instated in 1947. That was part of La Ley de la Mordaza. That was part of that of that, of that law. Mm -hmm. During that interim period in 1952 is when they had this quote unquote commonwealth vote and that is where the revolution of Albizu Campos and the subject matter of this book is, is, is all about. The planning, the rationale, the repercussions of, of that revolution. Was what he was basically doing was trying to interrupt that process and to let the world, it was basically modeled on the Irish Rising That's right. because he and Ivan Di Valero were friends and right. yeah. Albizu Campos helped to draft the, the free country of the, of the Irish free republic right. state. So the Irish rising didn't prevail, but it gave a, a moral signal to the rest of the world, which recontextualized the, the world knew that there was something going on. And, uh, otherwise, it would never have been known. So all Aldisu Campos was trying, he couldn't stop this ju American juggernaut, this military machine that had just bombed Nagasaki and Hiroshima into the Stone Age. But he just wanted to let the world know that this Commonwealth vote was a political travesty, that there was no, there was no foundation in wh whatsoever. Well, and this is where I'm bringing, uh, bringing it home. Part of it was, the, and that's the whole f reason, he, it was during the weekend, immediately prior to that vote, that this mm -hmm. revolution occurred. Mm -hmm. Let's move forward a few years. Now we're in 1956, where the, the vote did hold. The referendum vote was, was uh, uh, supposedly Puerto Rico determined its own future and voted, voted for Commonwealth. There was no need for this law anymore. So suddenly in 1956, it became legal to, own a, to, to, to speak or to own a flag. And Supposedly. that very year, that very year, yeah. within months, was the first day of the first parade, of the first Puerto Rican Day Parade in the United States. Mm. Because suddenly, we could be who we are, we could express ourselves, we could wave our flag. And it caught the, the, the New York by such surprise. They didn't know, people mm. didn't understand the psychological wellsprings of this. To this day, when you go to the Puerto Rican, they pray, La Bandera, we, don't, we don't even understand it. It's so embedded in it. But the, the, the psychic outburst on that, on that first parade, it caught everybody, it was, it was like an immediate hit. It became the biggest parade mm. in, in, in New York City, mm. in this media center. And no one knew where it sprung from, even the Puerto Rican, because it was just this explosion of feeling that existed in this community here yeah. on 104th Street They've been in his existence, with yeah. his grandparents, yeah. and they were feeling it all the way from the island. Well, wow. I'm telling you, uh, what, you're, what you're witnessing, um, Jim, um, is the essence of Puerto Rico. Um, a white Puerto Rican, a black Puerto Rican, uh, and we both love that island. 
And I love this guy because he wrote this book out of his heart, out of his loins, out of his intellect. And I would hope that all of you who are listening would pick up this book and go through it really, really rigorously. Memorize the verses in it. Memorize the chapters. Because it will help you understand how and why we are. You see, I think that the DNA of colonialism has almost permeated the consciousness, the skin of our souls. We do not think that we can win, and we can. We do not feel that we're, we're, we're worth it, and we are. I have to fight this every day. Every morning I get up, I say, you are worth it, and you're going to get up and do something. It's difficult. And our kids are out here on the streets, right outside the studio. And I try to hug them as much as possible. I try to give them my, my essence when I hug them. When I hug them, I hug them with all my essence. And when I see them, I see God. Muslims have a saying, the, the five percenters. When they greet you, they say, what's up, God? I believe that. What's up? What's up, King? I think we should start saying that to our children. So um, I'm sorry for getting emotional, but it no. is really, I don't know why it's coming out like this. But I, I listen to this guy, and I am amazed. I'm amazed because I want him to succeed. I want him to go all over the world with this book. I want him to be able to um, raise the flag of Puerto Rico everywhere, everywhere. Can I love I Argentina. God bless them. Yeah. <laughs> God bless them. <laughs> right. you know, Puerto Rico is where it's at. And I, and I embrace you both as brothers as well. And that's what this show is about. And I'm so honored and blessed to have you both here recounting your story and, and telling us all about what needs to be brought out. Um, I, 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 you know, I wanted to just mention I, uh, what your thoughts are concerning uh, AOC's recent efforts here to get the Puerto Rico Status Act um, enacted. And she, this is an email that was sent um, which he says, Thursday, this is past Thursday, historic day, the Puerto Rico Status Act passed the House for the first time in U.S. history. House of Representatives has acknowledged that the United States is a colonial force and Puerto Rico is, in fact, an extended colony. So she is saying uh, that this, the key elements of this bill were incorporated into the Puerto Rico Status Act, including the three parts. A binding plebiscite. Puerto Ricans have voted for changes in status in the past, but all were non-binding resolutions and saw no real changes to the island's relationship to the United States. The PR Status Act would ensure implementation of the status voted on by the majority, 51% of Puerto Rican population. Two, federally funded objective edu educational materials about all three status options will be shared in advance of vote. Of, of the vote in both Spanish and English so that Puerto Ricans can fully assess their options for the future. And finally, ends the option to continue, to continue the island's current territorial status. For the first time, Puerto Ricans will choose between three non-territorial status options, statehood, independence and sovereignty with free association to the United States. Now, she admits that these are, there's a lot more that needs to be put in, but these are key uh, points and uh, it's, it's just a first step. I'm curious what you may think about this, this effort. When you put animals yeah. um, in a cage and you feed them sugar all the time, um, you put sugar in the water, you put sugar in the food, and then you let them out. Um, Will they go for that which is sugar or will they go for that which is real food? What I'm saying is that we have been so colonized, and here's what I'm afraid of. Mm. We're, we are suffering the battered wife syndrome. Mm. America comes, beats us up, makes love to us or whatever, and then leaves. But they say, if you leave me, you will starve to death. You will have communism. You won't be able to make it. So they leave us with kids, they leave this woman pregnant, and, sh and when you tell her, leave him, you can do it on your own. You can make it on your own. You can get an education. I'll take it. They You're say, still not sure you can. 
You're I, so they, indoctrinated. They, they, no, you don't say. You know, I, I, I'm not sure. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, the, yeah, and yeah. then the other thing. <laughs> uh, and then the other thing is. Yeah. And I love him. You know, come on. Yeah, that's part of the so syndrome. That's part of the syndrome. So what happens is, and it's happened to me many times, where people have come to my apartment and said, "Look, we're ha I'm having a problem," and I go to get the guy, and he said, "No, no, but don't hurt him." Well, wait a minute. The man is hurting you. He's destroying your self-confidence. He's destroying your self-esteem. I'll help you get him out. My mother is telling me, no te mete, because in the end, you're the one who's going to get hurt. So I'm praying. Mm. And remember what, remember what, the, the, what was that experiment they did, Nelson, <laughs> with the fleas? Where um, fleas were kept in a flask, and they would all jump. They, they had no cover on it. You, read, you know that story? Continue. Well, yeah, they, they yeah. would jump out of the flask, of course. And, you know, fleas can jump 100 times their height or their weight, too. Um, and then they did an experiment. They put a cork on top of the flask and uh, for the third generation. And the third generation would go up, hit the, f hit the cork, and come back down. Hit the cork and come back down. By the fifth and sixth generation, they refused. Even though they took the cork off, they mm. refused. They didn't even jump. Still Can I, let me add two, two more experiments. There's a Seligman experiment, which was learned helplessness, where they ra randomly had no connection to any behavior that they engaged in. They randomly electrocuted, electrified dogs. Mm. So that nothing that they did, whether they pushed this lever or right, did, right, right, right. would have any relationship to the, the electrical sparks. So what they learned, learned helplessness. Yes. They learned to lie down and died as a, as a, as a, as a spice. No, and, and that's true with and, all and, people. Yeah, go ahead. And there's one more. Yeah. An, an elephant, you tether it in a circus. You yes. tether it strongly, right? Yeah. And, you, yeah. and you, you habituate it to the point where finally you have this little peg in the ground and, and, you, and, you put it, and the elephant will stay. It will stay right there. Well, <laughs> true with other people. Remember the sugar water thing? Yeah, yeah. I remember right. when, when Puerto Rican mothers here in this community would give their kids sugar water yeah. to calm them down. And uh, my mother used to tell them, because she was aware of it, please give them water. Their teeth would rot. Yeah, yeah. To see a young, beautiful Puerto Rican, the teeth are rotten. We've gotten used to the sugar. We will no, buy, we will go, we will buy uh, a Minute Maid orange juice rather than the oranges from Puerto Rico. We will buy mangoes from Israel. Rather than uh, yeah. mango juice, rather than take Hinkong has. Have you ever been to the Valley of the Mangoes in no. Hinkong? No. They're all yes. over the place. They're, I mean, the, the wonderful fruit. Just yeah. fruit. But we will not do that because we feel now it's, be, it's beginning to change. Right. But we still feel that American products are better than ours. I want to get just one point can, back. Can I just interject something yeah, okay, on this sure, vote sure. issue too? Sure. It's, a, it's loaded dice because yeah. it's, in terms of statehood, statehood, no matter, you could call it a blinding plebis or what, in the end, the plenary jurisdiction under Articles 2 and, and, and 5, the territorial supremacy clauses of the United States Constitution give exclusive and unique jurisdiction over this issue to the to US Congress. So any vote the, we engage in is up to Congress. And just let oh, me so make even in the end in the end, end, it's end that's their yeah. decision. It's their I and, see. And just bear, bear this in mind. So you can add two senators yeah. and without ha engaging in, yeah. in the constitutional amendment, but you can't cannot add Congress people. So it's a zero sum game. Right. If five if five if Puerto Rico becomes a state and gains let's say six Congress people, right. then six states will have to be will willingly divest themselves of a and a they're seat. not going to. I, I don't think so. So it's a few that's, left. That's yeah. well, that's one. Yeah. The, the Republican Party will especially uh, be against uh, because back. they don't. Yeah. That's uh, that's politically, economically, the Jones Act will 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 be will uh, uh, very quickly be eliminated. Because the, because there will be a lot of pressure to ex, to exempt Puerto Rico just say ha like it happened with the, the Virgin Islands, yeah. but there's one other key element here economically. The U.S. Uh, economy is about 17 trillion a year. I think we went over this last week. The uh, U.S. municipal bond market is about four trillion a year. Mm. So every year, four out of six, but roughly 22 percent, 20 to 22 percent of the U.S. American economy is being filtered through these financial instruments from Wall Street, the municipal bonds. Right, right. Puerto Rico has the only triple tax exempt bonds in the country. Mm. The triple tax, the federal, state, municipal taxes, that will be eliminated. That is fiscal crack to Wall Street. There is no way that Wall Street it's will so willingly divest themselves. Yeah, yeah. In addition, Puerto Rico, as a state now, will have chapter nine uh, access to chapter nine bankruptcy re renegotiate. They'll be able to renegotiate this debt immediately, ab initio, as a state. Once Puerto Rico gets to, to renegotiate the largest debt in U.S. history, $73 billion. More all than New York City's all, debt, right? Uh, well, seven, way more, course, yeah, 17. Course, way but, uh, then all 50 states, especially all the underlying, the, uh, the, the, uh, the teachers' unions, right. the municipal unions, they, they, they are deeply invested in these municipal bonds. 
All 50 states will yeah. simultaneously seek to re renegotiate their debt. That will be the mean the implosion right. of the municipal bond and Wall Street. There's no tower, way the no point. Way it's so happen. when right. you think economically, politically, and sociologically, when a when a governor said that when a, a Trump said build a wall and, and he gets elected. We're in a state right now where it's highly unlikely that the U.S., that the, especially in a Citizens United world with money flowing ab above and under the table, that Congress is, will willingly concede Puerto Rico its statehood, even if it votes for it. Yep. So, it's, uh, so as I said, that election, yeah. that, that bill is full of loaded dice. It's a rigged loaded. game. It's a rigged game. It's a rigged game. So we turn to the spiritual in the sense that what my point I wanted to get across a couple of minutes ago was that... Uh, even under 400 years of slavery, the ancient Israelites, 20, only 20% 20 or so followed Moses out of Egypt. And what's, worse, th and what's worse, they got mad at him for taking them out of Egypt. Yeah, said, yeah, and, and there. the remnants. So it's we're talking, unbelievable. So it, 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 but still, the, the remnants, out of those remnants, and out of the tremendously rich history you've both been talking about here, we're still surviving, and we still and have and to have hope. And, and I yeah. believe in that. Um, in the end, it's faith and hope. Um, I have a poem about that. Um, there's a call outside my window, a sweet whistle. No bird can do this. A meadow fresh green grass message that pulls you to listen intently in solitude to the song that's been playing so long inside. When even strangers know the combination of your heart and tears burst out when you remember the incidents, the moments when you were playing too close to the edge and then decided not to jump into that which you thought you wanted, especially at night, is when you realize that the call is for you. To stop is wisdom. The prayer you kneel for is God talking. I talk, but usually the voice inside crashes through my surface spirit and clearly points out the things to do. Leave the past. Mm. Walk in faith and believe that God is in the room. Tonight again, the call was clear that he never leaves me. I always do the splitting. And while he loves me so much, he can only work when I let go. I didn't hear the full melody tonight because flesh and stupidity broke in at regular intervals, but I know the song real well. I've grown with it these last few months, and the chorus goes something like this. You can't jumpstart God's purpose once he, can't, once he has his hands on you. Relax in the miracle and watch life unfold and be honest with your feelings. I've discovered that if you ask for protection and a break from the world, he'll free you of need and silly impulse. I'm sorry, folks. He'll free you of need and silly... Contra, pero que es esto? I don't know why I jump into the rain when the sun is right there, but I do it. I'm going to read that again. I don't know why I jump into the rain when the sun is right there, but I do it. And now the time has come to do one thing at a time and live in love and wait for the lesson plan and follow that call. I hear it now. God, I love that tune. So much of what you're saying I have poems for, it, so I'm amazed. I, we, we, and I would, we would love to hear <laughs> more, uh, but we've got like about a minute or so. But we do have... <laughs> the book in the house. We have God, we have your poetry, we have your work, and the war against all Puerto Ricans. This is a book that everyone needs to, to needs to read. Um, and um, you tried also, I, I, I wanted to ask you too, maybe in closing here, your, your incredible film, um, Make America Great Again. Who was the major protagonist that you tried well, to? Well, it was, it was played by Chi Chi. Did you get the yayo in the movie Scarface? Yes. And, uh, so what would he say movie. about our discussion today, do you think? You well, he would say that, uh, that, that, that the more things change, the more they stay the same. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that, that there's, been, there's a sh been a shared experience uh, when uh, Malcolm X said that we didn't land on Plymouth Rock, Plymouth Rock landed on us. Uh, when you look at the land expropriation vis-a-vis -vis Mexico, at the Ponce Massacre, uh, and the the uh, internment of Japanese people, uh, right around that same period of time, there's a sense of American exceptionalism that uh, I think has now, uh, it, we have come to a point where, we, where things are uh, evening out and mm -hmm. we, we start to see the, 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 the fissures and the, the contradictions. And we're, at, I think, at, at, at a pivotal point in our national history 
where we and have an opportunity of, of self-definition, but it, it's but it, it has to be it's now it's now a choir. There is not one taskmaster that it, and so I think that's part of the chaos chaos that we're involved in. We're trying to see what sort of uh, in terms of a tune, yeah. what sort of concerted harmony we, we can we can create going forward. And absolutely, it's, it's and we've got to we've got to create and keep that harmony and radical love as best we can. But we've run out of time here on the radical imagination. I thank you so very, very much for thank your you narrative, for your, your, your talking today to us all. And uh, thank you so very, very much for watching us here on The Radical Imagination. Get him out of here! Hello, my name is Rogelio Yola, and I'm looking for a job. Yes, that's uh, the appointment. I have a college degree from the Instituto Tecnológico de Santo Domingo and I'm willing to work very hard. I am very well known in the neighborhood. I love New York and I have excellent reference. Your call is very important to me. Please leave a message and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. The one thing that drove my life was coming to America. The land of opportunities. The land of the free, where all men I created equal. I am willing to travel, work overtime, and my salary, no problem. I will work with your budget. In fact, any offer at this point is a great offer. I'm fully bilingual with strong skills in computers, and I love to cook lasagna. I'm also a firm believer in the world of the great Ronald Reagan. The past few days when I've been at that window upstairs, I've thought a bit of the shining city upon a hill. The phrase comes from John Winthrop, who wrote it to describe the America he imagined. What he imagined was important because he was an early pilgrim, an early freedom man. He journeyed here on what today we call a little wooden boat. And like the other pilgrims, he was looking for a home that would be free. I've spoken of the shining city all my political life, but I don't know if I ever quite communicated what I saw when I said it. But in my mind, it was a tall, proud city built on rocks stronger than oceans, windswept, God blessed and teeming with people of all kinds living in harmony and peace. A city with free ports that hummed with commerce and creativity. And if there had to be city walls, the walls had doors and the doors were open to anyone with the will and the heart to get here. Make America great again. Get them out of here! Starring Angel Salazar from Scarface. Hollywood, Al Pacino, Chichi. Get the yayo! Chichi, get the yayo!